Hello and you're very welcome to the JMI podcast. I'm John Wan, and of course this podcast is brought to you by orgoretcha.com and the tech that he using promo code JMAC podcast to get 15% off on orgoretcha.com and get the best skins, gloves and equipment on the tech that he be tech minded. And if you like what you're seeing, like and subscribe on YouTube because the sports has been absolutely brilliant so far. And tonight I have the great, great pleasure of being joined by former Mayo All-Star Keith Higgins for a chat, a run through his uh, career, the Mayo situation at the minute and uh, everything goes with that. So it's an absolute pleasure to have Keith tonight. How are you keeping, Keith? Good, John. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All good here. Looking forward to the weekend. Happy days, Keith. Happy days. And yeah, I think that's probably the buzzword going around, Keith. Just looking forward to the games this weekend. Great to have a bit of normality back. So um, I'm presuming you'll head to the Mayo game this weekend? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, I haven't fully made up my mind yet now at the moment. But uh, yeah, I think we will. Look, it's, I suppose it's a bit frustrating with the home games. Not being in Mayo this year with the redevelopment of Cale Park and the pitch there, having to travel to Sligo, but um, you know, look, it's not too far away. It's only up the road, and any time we've played in the goal of the last number of years, they've been decent games. They've all been fairly tight. So, look, I think like every other supporter in the country, just mad to get back to games and get back to games with this full crowd and full atmosphere. So, it's uh, it was a strange one this time last year. We didn't know when we'd be back, and we could wait until April, I think. But you know, it's good that we got the all clear there last week, the week before, and. I think for everyone around the country, it's just full team ahead to get to games and just watch games and experience the atmosphere all over again. Hundred percent, Kate. Hundred percent. I suppose, yeah, definitely. It's great to have it back. And you know, I know we've had the Bourne Cup, we've had the McKenna Cup, and we've had the FBD League, and it's 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 just been a great outlet for everyone. Obviously, after the COVID and obviously last Friday, the restrictions were lifted, so it's fantastic. I suppose vibes at the minute, it's great. But Keith, I suppose it, it is great to have it back. And I suppose where uh, we heard today, Jess Doherty is back in amongst the Mayo lads again since 2019. Uh, the last game we played was against Donegal in the 2019 Championship. So. Things are looking good. Killing O'Connor is fit again, and you know, Mayo's going to take it on again, Keith. <laughs> yeah, back down the road again, and sure, look, we don't know any different as well down here at this at this stage. But um, you know, like you said, I think the main thing there is when the team came out was just seeing Jason Doc named. Um, you know, you'd hopefully that'll be the team that'll start, and he'll get he'll get to go. But um, you know, it's been a long, tough run from since August 2019 when he did the hit against Donegal. Um. Obviously, he kind of had a recurrence of injury the following year and then kind of paired fingers again last year. So, knowing the guy like I do, he'll have been doing everything that he needs to do over the last couple of years to get himself right. And, yeah, look, looking for a big performance out of him. Hopefully, Sunday, I think he can definitely add a bit of, a little bit of steel, a bit of a tactical forward line, maybe something different that they had in last year. So, yeah, hopefully, it'd be good to see him back and hopefully get back to the same level that he was. Great to see if I like that back and that uh, full forward line is looking very good at the minute. I think um what's it um I see her talk during the week, maybe a potential of Ryan O'Donoghue, Kenyon O'Connor and Jason Doherty. So Keith, that would definitely be a good full forward line to mix in with. And I suppose kinda of touching uh, touching on this year, obviously last year getting to the All Iron final against Throne and Throne coming out on top. But I suppose it is probably good signs and you know, obviously to get the Crow Park again, to experience that again and you know, to follow it on this year. So, you know, maybe what was maybe the thoughts uh, briefly on last year, the final against Throne? You know, you're close once again, but obviously, again, you can only keep learning from these experiences, Keith. Yeah, again, I suppose look, the overriding feeling for it for myself and I suppose for the players and, and for all the supporters was one of just frustration. I think um, we were kind of talking off there a while ago, just about, you know, obviously didn't play well on the day, but still weren't too far away from, you know, we're always kind of in contention, maybe a couple of three points. Four points away from Tyrone, I think went out to five when they got the second goal, but again, kind of clawed it back to two or three points. So, we're never too far away, but I suppose just never really looked like pushing on and maybe getting that level of performance that they need to get over the line, which in a way you kind of wonder sometimes whether you should do whatever it takes at this stage. But yeah, I think frustration was the main thing last year, but at the same time, you have to look at it, I suppose, in realistic terms, James is kind of trying to build probably a new team there. There's a lot of guys gone since he came in in first in 2019. Um, a lot of rebuilding going on, some new guys coming through. And, you know, it's probably going to take time for them guys to make their own stamp on things and kind of, you know, make this team their own, you know. So, like, likes of Lee, Kevin McLaughlin, probably Jason Dock aren't going to be around forever. So, I said, the likes of Oshie and Tommy, Ryan, these guys are going to have to make this team their own over the next couple of years. And, you know, fingers crossed, we won't be too far away. Definitely, Kate, 100%. And obviously, Ken, looking ahead to this year, obviously, a uh, good FPD league campaign, blooding a few uh, new lads, and obviously, looking ahead, looking ahead to the league campaign uh, this this weekend, starting against Donegal. So, 
it's back once again, Keith. It's great to have it back. So I suppose maybe hopes and expectations for the year ahead for Mayo, Keith. Same again, obviously. But uh, can you see James Horn put a lot of emphasis on the league and try to blood uh, young lads and obviously get Jason Doherty back flying fit? I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think you know, like obviously back to the old way with Division One A teams. It's doggy dog up there. You know, you can't have kind of too many bad days or you're staying on the barrel of relegation. So I think they'll have to put a lot of emphasis on it. Um, he put a lot of emphasis on maybe getting some game time into some younger lads like Young on there, centre forward, Young McHugh, name centre back. So hopefully those guys will get some game time in. Um, and then as like I said, getting game time into maybe Jason Dock and hopefully Killing then as well to come to the end of the league. So there's probably a lot of kind of things for him I suppose to work on throughout this league, and probably a lot of things he wants to get out of it. I think, you know, would you set a league target as a real ambition? Probably not. If you were to get kind of close to a league final, you'd probably be happy with that. Um, but yeah, I think the league really about kind of building that team again, getting game time into certain players. And look, I suppose from a Mayo point of view, anytime you draw a goal in the first round of a Connacht Championship, you can't have too much further than that. So I think it'll be kind of really geared towards building, getting everyone prime shape for that first round game, and you know, hopefully taking off from there. An award, obviously, on Kenny O'Connor. Obviously, his absence was definitely a big loss uh, last year. So, hopefully, he's back flying fit. And, obviously, it probably will take a bit of time to get him back to top of the pops, as I say, Keith. But, you know, it's nearly like having a new player this year in, in uh, Killian, Keith. Yeah, look, like you said, any time a team loses their, their, their top four or their top scorer, you know, he's not top scorer in the history of the championship for no reason. You know, like any time a team loses him, they're going to suffer. But, you know, you have to I suppose give credit to Ryan and Tommy and a few of the other boys who stepped up last year in his absence. But you know, it'll be good to have him back. I suppose it'll give that bit of reassurance to the guys around him. Um, his leadership in that full forward line was talked a lot about last year when he wasn't there. So again, he'll add something to that. Again, especially with Jason Dock back as well, he can maybe add to it. So definitely going to be a benefit to Mayo. Um, but like you said there, you know, if he gets a couple of games towards the end of the league. He's going to need a lot more time then to get back fully fit, match sharp. Because look, he's been out since about last June, May, June. Yeah, it's some time to be out. It's a, it's a tough injury to come back from, so he will need time. That's what. That's the one thing you'd hope people wouldn't be expecting him in his first couple of games back to be shooting the lights out again straight away. So you know he'll take time to progress, but look, he'll come back in good shape. The way he looks after himself, um, he won't be too far off the pace. But uh, yeah, again, he's going to be a big addition whenever he does get back. Definitely, definitely. And obviously, uh, Kieran McDonald was involved last year, and I think he's uh, part of company with the Mayo team in the last couple of months. But obviously, you know, it, it looked like he had his stamp on that team, and obviously, it maybe family commitments, work commitments, he had to leave. But you know, what a legend to have about the place, and no doubt you might see him maybe potentially managing coach of the team once again in a couple of years. Absolutely, yeah. I don't think he's gone from what I know. Anyway. Oh, is he, is he still there? I thought he was yeah, gone. Yeah, right. was yeah. That stuff came out after the Ireland last year but no I think as far as I know he's there and he's raring to go so oh Jesus right yeah, yeah. breaking news breaking news <laughs> no, no, just, unless now something has changed I'm not aware of it could be completely wrong here but um, look I suppose Kieran Mack kind of has that was reputation or he's kind of has that aura about him and you know even when he came in first couple of years ago with James like, I obviously played with Kieran I knew him from previously but you know, he's a very good Good guy. He's a very good football brain. He knows exactly kind of how he wants players to play and he wants the team to play. Um, you know, the trainings are really good, really intense. And you know, I think that's kind of what you need from selectors or coaches. You need them kind of having different opinions sometimes to the manager, maybe questioning each other and getting the best out of each other. But look, a guy with his reputation, players will always want him around the place and always respect him. And like I said, he's, he seems to be working with some of the forwards there very well. Like you see the way Ryan has come on the last couple of years. So yeah. look, if he can get that out of it, a couple of more guys, you know, it, it all bodes well. Definitely. And obviously with Killian being back as well, uh, Keith, that's a massive addition. So I think this year could be, but hopefully a good year for the senior, Mayo senior footballer. So I suppose, Keith, uh, kind of touching on to yourself, obviously uh, you represented the Mayo senior footballers from 2006 to 2021. You won one National League, four All-Stars and eight Connick titles, uh, Keith. So that's really sensational stuff, really. And the, the amount of uh, All-Stars is absolutely terrific and everything goes with that, Keith. So I suppose looking back, Keith, uh, good going. Not bad, yeah, not bad. I think, um, you know, like I said there, I suppose we had some, a lot of good days out, a lot of, a few bad days out as well, thrown in the mix. But, um, you know, I think you look back on it and the All-Stars and all that are great. But, you know, obviously, I would, I've always said it's not a regret that we didn't win Ireland, but obviously it's a big disappointment when we came so close. But, 
you know, I've there for 15 years. Like it's, when you're growing up, all you want to do is play football from there. So when you get that chance, you know, you want to do it for as long as you can. And, you know, you enjoy it as much as you can and you get what you can out of it. And, you know, thanks for it with a decent innings. Okay, definitely, definitely. I suppose when you were kind of a young lad, kind of starting off, and you know, obviously representing your uh, club, Bally Hornets, like was this something you always wanted to do, to kind of represent the Mayo Senior Footballers? Because obviously, it's football mad up there. The supporters are absolutely, I suppose, crazy for one of a better word, a good crazy. Yeah. But Kate, uh, was it something you always wanted to do? Yeah, look, like I said, it's when you're growing up in May, you can't really get away from it. You know, it's kind of. 9, 10, 11 years of age when we were getting to the All Ireland's back in 96, 97. So at that age, it was kind of the excitement was building around that. It was kind of you, you're obviously buying into that from being in school and all the talk around the local club, obviously, because we had David Nestor involved. Um, so yeah, I think when you're in Mayo, you can't get away from it. So look, I was sports mad as a young guy, football and hurling. So that's kind of all you ever wanted to do. And uh, progressing in through school and underage teams, I suppose that you would have dreamed of playing for me. I know I personally never thought I was, I was good enough to play for it, but um, yeah, look, once you got the chance, you have to take with both hands. And um, luckily, kind of things worked out well for me. Mm-hmm. Definitely, Keith, definitely. And I suppose, obviously, kind of get breaking on to the team and obviously your club, Bally Hans, and you know, we, we've all seen Mayo Club football on the TV, how strong it is, you know, the, the variety of players. And obviously, Kevin McLaughlin's club uh, got very close in the last couple of weeks as well. So, you know, the standard of club football within Mayo, you know, can it really can propel your propel any kind of athlete in Mayo to the next level, Keith? Because, you know, when you're at top of the pops, really flying for the club, that's always going to give you a good sporting chance for the uh, county setup, Keith. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like I said, you know, when I was growing up there, like I said, you had Mayo getting to All Ireland's 96, 97, and then you had Ballina, Cross Malina, you know, getting to All Ireland club finals and winning them, um, you know, as the years kind of went on. So there was always kind of something happening at national level um, with the club and the county in Mayo. So our club in fairness would be intermediate all the time. So we were kind of never hitting them heights. But I think for me, the one area that I kind of really kind of was developed my interest in it and really kind of got serious about football was when we were playing in school um in secondary school you know we were kind of with a very good team there we were getting to Connacht Day titles against the great Jarrett's teams um we're getting to all Ireland B finals you know um so really kind of at that stage that's kind of where it kind of really developed for me and it probably got a bit more serious and that kind of led on then to being involved with minor teams and under 21 after that so I think the schools was great because you were enjoying it you were kind of playing with guys from different clubs as well and there was a whole bit of a lot of crack around it as well, but um, yeah, I think for me that was where it kind of really took started getting uh, taken off and kind of getting a bit serious about it. Yeah, I suppose Keith, obviously, can you tell me about kind of obviously the standards kind of club ball within Mayo at the minute because we do see it is seriously strong and obviously if you're obviously your Bally Hans is at this world and you know so like not not more as well. So like the standard up there, Keith, obviously has to be very good because year in year out and James Horan keeps coming back with really 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 good young teams and um, players that are going to be there for ten or twelve years have that longevity within the county set up and that's very few and far between at the minute, Keith. So like the standard must be very good and high up there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you look back over the last probably five or ten years of club football in Mayo, you have you had Ballon Tober who were flying there for a few years, you'd catch the bar then get into all Ireland finals. Um you know, then you had Bracey obviously as well, we're never too far away, even though they haven't kind of got over the line at county title level. Then you just look at not more the last two years going back to back. Westport have been pushing on, Ballon have been coming along again. So, you know, there's always kind of teams that are kind of pushing along and I suppose Again, like I said, you go back over the last 10 years, majority of them teams have been backbone the county panel. Um, and, you know, it is it is competitive at senior level. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you'll always pick out the stronger teams. But even if it's Gary Moore this year, kind of got to a semi-final, could easily have gotten to a final. So it is very competitive. You pick out six, probably six or seven teams every year who could be there or thereabouts. So, look, I think you need that. You need good competitive club structures if you're going to have a good county pa- or set up, I think. So... Um, and like you said there, if you have two or three good players feeding in from each of them teams, you're in with a decent chance at county level. So, um, but look, I suppose that always goes back then to suppose what's been done at underage. And you know, like any sport, like any county or club, if you have good underage structures in place, it gives you, I suppose, a fighting chance then when you get to senior. Mm-hmm. Definitely, Kate. And touching on to your uh, senior days with uh, Mayo as well, and obviously making your 
debut in 2006, Keith. So, and obviously, uh, a year you did get to the All Ireland final against this, obviously a star studied um, Kerry team. We all know about the power and strength of your team as well, Conor Mortimer, Kerry McDonald, and yourself, everyone that peak of the powers, and you were obviously making that burst on. So, 2006, Keith, getting to an All Ireland um, football final, not a bad year, not a bad year, and way to start uh, your career with Mayo. Yeah, but it was 05 was my first year in, but we didn't play too much. You kind of a couple of different injuries. But yeah, 06, then it kind of took off. We kind of had the under-21 win in April of that year. Um, and then there was a good show. Of those lads kind of brought into the senior panel after that. And it was a good, we had a good summer. We had a good run of it. Um, like, the more you think back, there were some really, really good footballers on that team, like David Heaney, James Nallan, Aidan Higgins, um, David Brady, Kiermack, Dylan Mortimer, Kevin O'Neill. Well, there was some very, very good footballers on that team. And obviously, we kind of came up against Kerry teams who were absolutely outstanding. I mean, you go through that team and they were absolutely phenomenal players. Um, you know, so we came up against a team that were unbelievable. We probably should have got more out of that team, even though some of the players were probably coming towards the end of their careers. You know, I think you know, I think if we'd have kept Mickey Moore and John Morrison on for another year. Yeah, have, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, look, I think... There, there really was a good team there. We just probably we should have got a bit more out of it. But look, yeah. that's the way a cycle is going. That's the way things go. But um, yeah, look, for me personally, it was a great year to kind of get started with. I suppose the downside of it sometimes is you think it's always going to be that good. But, um, you know, look, I couldn't have asked for anything better I'm probably in my second or probably first full year at it. I have to ask you about Mickey Moore, and obviously, because, um, you know, I think Conor Mortimer tweeted after uh, Kiku won the Ulster Championship there a couple of weeks ago, and he was going to say, and he definitely, Mickey Moore, and we all know Conor Mortimer, I think he, could, uh, he likes uh, he likes using just the phone, as you probably well know, Keith, I think he's uh, Mr. COVID uh, master COVID after all this. Yeah. COVID expert, Keith, uh, we all know about him, but um, he did make a very good point. If, if, if Mickey Moore did get that one more year in 2007, the sky could have been the limit, Keith. So at that time, do you feel that was the right decision for uh, Mickey Moran to step down? Oh, absolutely not. I don't think it was a decision of Mickey stepping down. I think it was, you know, I think it was taken out of his hands. I remember the night he got Ireland, been at the banquet and making a speech, and the plans were to be back for next year. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks or, or months later, he was gone, and John O'Mahony was in place. Like, and you know, everyone knows John O'Mahony's record at the time. He was so good with Galway, and obviously with Leeds from previously with Mayo and. You know, he was he had that kind of status around Mayo, like and it can't be questioned. But at the same time, when you have two guys like Mickey Moore and John Morrison there and do such a good job in their first year, and since we just gotten rid of it, it was obviously just something not right there. It was a strange decision. I don't think any of the players would have backed it to be honest. But look, that was a decision that was made at the time and I think it was one we'd probably regret a small bit because they were two phenomenal coaches, two phenomenal men and they knew how to get the best out of players. I have to ask you about 2006, the uh, All Ireland semi final against the Dubs, you know, the Battle of the Hill and everything that went with that, Keith. And God, if, if anyone is uh, if anyone has any brains to go on and watch it for the crack, I think uh, it was just sensational entertainment. Uh, obviously, I think we all know what happened that day lamp and balls going up to Hill 16, having the crack fans, all the Dubs. So, Keith, a word on the 2006 uh, All Ireland semi final against Dublin. Oh, geez, what can you say about it? It was carnage, I suppose. Um... Like, it's funny, people always ask me this, I've been asking about it for the last 15 years, like, and was it planned, and who planned it, and to this day, I actually honestly don't know. David Brady, I heard, no? Yeah, I heard a story that a couple of the senior guys said it the night before, they kind of planned the night before. I li- Honestly, all I remember is going out, and we're sitting down, getting the photograph taken, and then someone said, said down to the hill, and I don't know who it was, I just heard a voice saying, down to the hill. And of course, we all stood up and took off down to the hill and sure, you know, 21 year year old on our back, I just followed the rest of them and uh, yeah, it just turned into absolute carnage. Like I used to have a routine where I'd go in behind the goal and just start kicking out balls, the lads were shooting, but there was stuff raining down on top of us. So I just said, no, I'm getting out of here. And I just went out and started running around the pitch and there was footballs flying and shoulders flying and nutritionists getting hit in the head with football. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was trying to be talk then whether we'd go back down to the canal and do a warmth down there but we said no we weren't going to give in at that stage and <laughs> at that stage I think it was just everyone was just hoping that the time would come to win the ball and just get on with things. The ultimate season for Taldi I suppose Keith because obviously he's did go on he's got the result Kerr McDonald 
kick some of the most outrageous scores I've seen in a football pitch that day, Keith, and Jesus, like if anyone looks back on them. I suppose like, that kind of siege mentality to kind of get the win over Dublin that year. And like after that game, he's obviously touched himself, right, lads, this has to be our year. Obviously, Kerry were at the other side of that draw to get, you know, we all know how the final ended up. But like, you know, do you feel that year that it was a bit of an underperformance or was that Kerry team so star studied that performance was nearly expected? Um, yeah, I think... We probably believed this more with the hype too much after that semi final. You know, people were saying it was one of the best games ever and it was a great performance. And it's funny, I actually watched the game back there last year, sometime maybe during one of the lockdowns was on TV. And I look back and, and like it was a this football probably wasn't great. There was an awful lot of mistakes. It probably wasn't the best game football wise, but had just so much excitement from us having a good start, Dublin coming back into it, then going seven up and then. The comeback like so it was probably the one of the most exciting games but not one of the best games we probably bought into the hype that it was a great game and that you know, we were really good but um i think there was probably a bit of naivety as well coming up against kerry with especially with donnie in full forward i mean we probably you know there was no real huge tactics back in them days it was 15 v 15 and we probably would have been a bit smart on how we dealt with things but um look that's all it's easy to say now i suppose like i said back then it was just you know it was 15 on 15 you went out and you played the game yeah. He kind of got a few matchups, and that was it. But um, you know, I think as I said earlier, we had a very good, we had a very good team, and we had some very good players there. But like I said, that Kerry team was just fifteen. So you know, I don't think even if we had played as good as we can, we probably wouldn't have won that game. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, absolutely star story. That was a Kieran Donny and the boys were really getting going, I suppose, Keith. And obviously, can you, you talk to me about that? Can you, and you were obviously kind of saying back then, like it was man to man. Probably enjoyable, Keith. Probably an enjoyable game to play. And now it's just gone so defensive, tactical, and long range shooting, passing backwards, passing sidewards, passing back to the keeper. Suppose, suppose, Keith, like how much has changed since now to then? Ah, it's, it's changed hugely. I mean, like even I remember vividly remember one of the quarter final against Leash. Um, at one stage in that second half, like I said, we, we said there was, there was no tactics, or whatever. But at one stage, that second half, there was whatever way Leash played or whatever way the game was developing, there was just myself and Dermot Gertie in the full back line and we were marking the two corner forwards and there was no other player within 60 yards of us and it was just like, right, if the ball breaks here and they get the ball in, like, you know, you're you're not going to win that one if there's a 2v2 inside the 60 yards. So, you know, there was, it was just kind of get the ball a lot of the time and, you know, hand pass through or, or kick it. There was no blanket defences or sweepers or anything yeah. like that. But it has changed huge amount and it has changed tactically wise it has changed physically wise s and c nutrition everything that goes on behind the scenes as well so there's no real comparison like when i came in first you know you might go to the gym you'd be in the gym program but it was literally probably benching and squatting and maybe shoulder or something like that there wasn't and it was all kind of you know, it wasn't really individualized there was no such thing as power sessions or dynamic stretch and all this it was just all one for all type of stuff so like the changes in it have been huge but i think they've all been for the better Physically wise, you see the shape players are in now, and it's probably just making the game faster and more exciting. Well, not the way it's been played, I suppose, but you know, athletically players are a lot better. I suppose Kate, you could really say like maybe from 2006 to maybe 2011, and then maybe the blanket kind of came back in 2012, and I know Tyrone kind of had it back in 2006 or eight, whatever. Like, but they could mix it. But I suppose up until that, how was it? How enjoyable maybe was it to play from maybe let's say 2006 to 2011 or 12? If you kind of get me that kind of sort of freestyle football, because I really do feel when Donny Gall won the All Ireland in 2012, a lot of teams started adapting that defensive football, Kate. Yeah, I think so. Like even. It was more, I suppose, enjoyable in the fact that, look, there wasn't too much stuff that you'd have to figure out in the pitch. You know, you were kind of, if you're a cornerback, well, right, you're marking this corner forward and you mark him and, and that's it. Um, whereas now you, you don't know where the other players are going to be. Like I said, there could be 13 players behind the ball and you go back with them, you not go back with them, you have to fit in space, you press up, where do you go for kickouts and all this type of thing. You know? So it was probably a little, a little less complicated. Um but at least you kind of just knew back then he was man on man. You had your job to do, and that was it nearly. Do you know what I mean? So I think in fairness, Tyrone probably brought in, I wouldn't call this more blanket defense. I think they just kind of brought a whole different physicality and intensity to it. You know, obviously they probably brought a few more men back behind the ball. But at the same time, you look at that Tyrone team from zero eight, the forwards they had. I mean, she couldn't have them playing back in their full back line. They oh, Jesus. They were too good. So they just brought a different kind of level of intensity to it, I think, more than anything else. 
then like I said, Donegal came along in 12 and just completely took it to an extreme. I think the problem with that is, while it worked really well for them, and again, while they might have brought 10 or 12 men back behind the ball, they still had McFadden, Murphy, and yeah. these guys up front who could finish at McBearty, so they still had good forwards as well at the end of it. Um, whereas other teams then tried to adopt it, and they were just bringing men back for the sake of bringing men back. They would think, right, we'll just keep the score down, we might win it, whereas they weren't trying to go out and attack as well at the same time, if that makes sense. We were just trying to stop other teams rather than out and winning the game. So I think that had a big knock on effect for teams for a good few years. But I think eventually now you've seen Dublin and probably May as well, 2013, 14, 15, it was very much kind of attacking all out football. Dublin then tweaked it after 14 because it was only goal, kind of that famous semi final. So um, but I think a lot more teams now are kind of going back to the whole attacking football side of things. And I think Tyrone this year will probably. They probably got that balance right between being defensive when you need to be, but also pushing up and playing very attacking football when you need it to as well. And I think that's the key is just to get that balance right. Mm-hmm, definitely key, definitely. Obviously, kind of you get in that final in 2006 and then you just didn't appear in another All Ireland final till 2012, Keith. So, you know, what maybe was there a bit of a drop off point? Did a lot of lads maybe leave the panel after 2006? Maybe it was quite an aging team in 2006. So maybe like they just need, need men, more men on board, or was there a bit of a bit of a lull after 2006? Or what would you kind of put that down to? Yeah, I think there was a bit of a lull. You know, I think 2007, we got the league final under John in 2007, but again, like I said, it was. I wouldn't say an aging team, but you some guys who were there probably 10 or 12 years, maybe come at the end of it, like James and Allen, David Brady, Kevin O'Neill, Kieran Mack, and they were suffering from a lot of injuries as well. And there's probably a bit of transition as well going on, trying to get some of the younger lads from that under 21 team in 06 coming through. So, you know, we'd decent league going back to league final in seven and then got bet by Galway, I think, in the Connacht Championship. and. You know, we had a couple of kind of tough championship campaigns then, 07-08. Um, then got to a quarter final against Mead in 09. Probably should have won, um, but we didn't. And then 10. It's hard to really kind of pinpoint what went wrong in 10, but just, you know, I suppose the, the wheel just completely came off and got bit by Sly going along for it. It was probably a low point for most boys' career, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, like I said, it was just... Probably very much a team in transition for those few years. Um, I think then, in fairness, James came in in eleven. He was probably just the right guy at the right time because he just changed the culture and the mentality of players. And I suppose you could see the knock-on effect that ever since, or not from ever since. Yeah, and obviously James Horn, he's he's there, and he, this is his second stint in charge. So I suppose what all did James change? Because I know obviously we were talking with Mickey Moore, and he was a great man to have involved. But you know, was it, what all did James change? Maybe for you personally, the team, and I suppose. The development of the team as a whole, or uh, Keith? Yeah, well, I think even in 11, again, he was, it was a very, very young team at that stage. Like said, Lee was coming in, Aidan was coming in, Donny Vaughan, um, Kevin McLaughlin. You know, it was like I was about 25. Um, you, know, you had a very, very young team coming through. Killian was coming through at 18 years of age. So, we had a lot of guys coming, young guys coming through. And I think he really just. It went about, I suppose, changing the mindset of players um, more than anything and the mentality of players and that, you know, there was really but real structure on, I suppose, the S&C side of things and the fitness side of things and the medical side and changing everything around the team, I suppose, rather than kind of just changing the mentality of the team as well, if that makes sense in the whole setup. Um, really kind of just started instilling a bit of belief in the team. Now, I suppose that kind of nearly <laughs> backfired in the first round of the championship over in London where we nearly got bet, but after that then, I suppose we probably weren't playing great. We were kind of eking out wins against Galway and against Roscommon. And we were kind of, I think we kept Galway, keep them to with one point in the second half or scoreless in the second half and did the same to Roscommon and then kept Corks to a point maybe in the second half that Ireland quarter final. So mm. we weren't playing awful well. We were kind of doing a lot of things right. And I suppose that just kind of built a lot of confidence in the lads. And you know, we got bet by Kerry in that 2011 semi-final, but again, we probably just weren't ready for them at that stage. Mm. Um, but then I think we kind of began to kind of get better and mature a bit more over 12 and 13, but probably still could have been a bit smarter at times in some of them games over them couple of years, and probably particularly the 13 final maybe, um, and probably the 14 semi-final. But look, James had a way of playing. He was all about all-out attacking, kind of really high-pressing, high-intensity, and that's the way he wanted to go. 
And like, I suppose what changes, Keith, because obviously like a manager comes in and if, if you were kind of saying there was maybe a bit of a lull since 2006 or maybe lads dropping off. So what does James, does he just say to lads, right, these are extremely good players. It just kind of bring that confidence back, kind of that winning mentality, get structures in place, get the right men involved. Like, it's just little tweaks like that make the big difference, Keith. Absolutely, yeah. Like, I think, you know, he got um, Ed Coughlin in, looking after, I suppose, the strength and conditioning, along with um, Liam Moffat, who's head of the SNC and the medical. And he kind of just put a more professionalism to it, I suppose. And when kind of lads mm-hmm. see that that professionalism there in the background, they'll kind of lead on from it. And, you know, small things in it kind of even it sounds like a very simple thing. I suppose I remember kind of doing group gym sessions where like you knew you kind of had to be there and you weren't kind of making excuses and not being there and missing out. And you knew lads were doing it so that you, you weren't going to kind of take the chance and not do it in case you were kind of falling behind. And then it was just a case of building that confidence in lads. And it's not a case of doing one particular thing. It was just nonstop trying to put the right structures in place and kind of telling lads every time that they're good enough and all that. And, you know, once you get a couple of wins behind you, it's kind of easier to kind of keep going with that mentality so it's hard to kind of say he just did one thing in particular I think it was probably a collective of a lot of small things that kind of built into it and you know after like I said probably that win against Cork and the Iron Quarter final 11 gave us a lot of confidence that you know we're not too far away because obviously they were the Ireland champions 2010 so mm. um, I think we kind of built got again got to a league final in 12 even though we got but we got bet by Cork and you know, you could see things were building with Beck Curry in that league semi-final in Crow Park, which is a huge one for us. Um, so, again, it was kind of small things like that. And then when you get a couple of good wins in the league, it gives you that kind of confidence, especially against the bigger teams like Kerry and Dublin. So, you know, a lot of things like that can kind of build a lot of confidence in a young team. Definitely, Keith, definitely. Kind of pushing on to 2012 and obviously uh, coming up against Donegal in the final. And again, just to see Ulster, Ulster teams, I think, when, when they get into finals, they just seem to be so hard bet the likes of Donegal, Tyrone, and teams like that in the past. So, you know, that obviously was a very strong Donegal team. And you were probably on maybe Paddy McBride or Colin McFadden. So, yourself, Percy, that day, what was that experience like? Because it was very close. Yeah, again, like it's funny, like you think back on all them all Ireland, we actually don't remember a huge amount of most of the days, to be honest, you'd obviously remember bits and pieces, but um, just remember in 12, obviously there's a huge atmosphere around it, um, you know, a savage day for a game and everyone looking forward to it and then just coming out and I can remember that goal going in for the first Murphy one and then the second goal kind of just getting a kind of a bad bounce coming off the post and after that then I suppose it just... He never really took off, even though we kind of got the gap back to maybe two points or three points at one stage. So you know, we were never too far away. I think we we played okay without playing really well. Um, just we're never able to break them down. Their just defensive setup was probably that much stronger. They were probably a bit more advanced than we were at that stage. Um, it was nearly a bit of a lull at times in that game. That was just we just weren't really able to click. And I suppose that comes down to the way they were playing as well. That they weren't going to let you do that. Um, so yeah, that was a tough one to take because, like I said, you know, it's, it's all lifts and butts really at this stage. But, you know, you take out those two early goals, there's definitely nothing between those two teams. Um, but we just couldn't break them down enough, unfortunately. I suppose, Keith, like it's a second, it's his own point kind of going through every single final. But I suppose to kind of keep back getting back on the horse, the preparation, the time, the effort that gets goes into all this, Keith, and maybe people, obviously, you, you see keyboard warriors and bits of pieces going, like, going around these days. But some people don't realise the work that goes into this the preparation to get to these finals as well, Keith. So year after year, essentially, for the last, what, 10 years we're talking, to keep getting there, Keith, Keith and, you know, you know, to, to nearly get there, it, it does take a lot of work and hard, uh, hard draft. Absolutely, yeah. And, like, it's, you know, I think a lot has been made of it over the last few years, I suppose, the amount of time and the own equipment goes into the inter-county game. Um, you know, it is, it can be all-consuming, maybe five, six, seven nights a week for some guys, but... You know, we used to make conscious effort that you'd always have one or two days off where you just kind of switch away from it nearly. Um, but at the same time, you know, you get into a routine of doing that training and doing the gym work, looking after nutrition, the S&C and all that. And at the end of the day, like, if you really want to be there, you'll do it. If you don't, you'll find the excuse not to do it or you'll take a break from it. But I think for us, like I said, it was just a case of knowing you're not that far away, always made it that bit easier to come back. You know, people would think it's the opposite because you're kind of losing big games or losing finals that it's hard to come back the next year well, it's not because you know you're in the top two or three in the country you know so you know, you know it makes that bit easier I'd probably find it more difficult if 
case we were getting bet in first round of the championships or not even or getting bet in the qualifiers, then you'd be kind of considering yourself. But when you know you're not too far away, it makes it easier. I thought it made it easier anyways. Definitely, definitely. Obviously, kind of like the, the preparation and obviously Croke Park, piping out day, all our finals, even the semi-finals, all the games building up to that, Keith. So what's it all like, obviously, the day itself, you know, the bus journey into Croke Park, you know, the fans are coming in, you are all getting prepared. So that whole experience itself, Keith, and you're in numerous all Ireland finals at this stage, the big days for Mayo. So what's it all like as a player? Because when you were growing up, Keith, it's Want stuff drinks. Yeah, and I suppose that's probably the one regret I'd have is that didn't probably take enough of it in. I probably don't remember enough of them days. Do you know what I mean? You'd kind of remember bits and pieces of the game or you bits and pieces of the build up, but you know, even say twenty seventeen, um remember very, very little of the, the day of the game or anything like that. Kind of remember being bits of the warm up or out in the pitch. Um you'd remember a few parts of the game or whatever went on during it, but very, very little because you're just, I suppose, you're kind of in, you know, you people here, you're in the zone or you're kind of just focusing on getting yourself right and getting your preparation. And, you know, the morning of the game, you're in the hotel and, you know, you're, everything's laid out, you're timing wise when you have your breakfast, when you eat, when you stretch, when you're leaving the hotel and team meeting. So it kind of goes fairly quick. But at the same time, when you're so focused on kind of just getting yourself right, you kind of nearly forget to actually take it all in and enjoy it. And that's probably the one regret I have. And that's kind of why. I'd say in there, I don't remember a huge amount of them days, you know what I mean? So, um, now obviously, if we won, I suppose that'd be a different kettle of fish, and you remember everything from it. But, mm. yeah, look, I'm sure some lads probably are a bit different, but yeah, that's just kind of my reflection of it. I mean, obviously, you remember kind of coming out on the pitch, and like the noise just hits you like a train, you know, it's it's you can't really hear anthem, but all you can hear is just buzz or this loud hum, and it's just non stop. And like it is a great atmosphere, and just look, playing in Cole Park is the best place to play. I mean, you just you feel 10 foot bigger and you feel like you can run 100 miles an hour out there and it's just, it's the place you want to be. I suppose the, the Crow Park on all our final day, like, and you obviously, you, when, you, when you get the chance to watch the, some of the games back and I suppose, how proud does it make you feel, Keith? Because obviously you're pay, you definitely always got the mark, the toughest players, the likes of Dublin, Mayo, Tyrone, any team at all there, Keith, over the years, Galway. So, you know, what, what was that experience like for yourself? Because when you're marking the best, playing in the best stadiums in Ireland, everyone's watching Keith, it's the stuff of dreams. Yeah, absolutely. And it's probably something you know, you never wish you think of that you'd be playing eighty in front of eighty two thousand, I suppose. But um again, the fact that you're kind of part of the team and there's a lot of guys around you, you know, you've always kind of you're not just there on your own, you kinda of got that help with you. So um, you know, it was great, it was what you wanted. It was kind of one thing that we always said that's where we want to be playing up in Co Park with the big crowds and that's kind of where you play your best. But well, you mentioned there about marking some of the best guys in the game and I actually used to enjoy that because Mm. And it gave you, I suppose, a target nearly. You know, you kind of had to kind of, you knew you had to be at your best. Um, and you just made sure that, look, you do your job for the team here. And if it's the case that you do your job well, then the team has a good chance of winning. So there was kind of that really selfishness to it as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I used to enjoy that. I used, I used to like getting the call to go on one of the best guys. And, you know, sometimes even used to <laughs> actively go after it and try and get them to put me on these guys because I just used to enjoy the challenge. Just kind of, that if I was on these guys, I knew I had to get my best, and I found it brought the best out of me. 100%. 100%. And I suppose, obviously, the challenge of it, and obviously, yeah, play, playing the dubs over the years, and you were probably marking the likes of Bernard Brogan, and you know, probably some of the best players who really kind of seen play the game, Keith. So, they, so that hammer and tong, the arousal Taz coming around in all Ireland final, the week leading into it, and I suppose when that when the ball goes up, when the whistle, when the whistle blow, Keith, that's when you know you're at the peak of your powers. Yeah, absolutely. and. You know, that's the one thing about playing Dublin, whether it's in a league game, whether it's in an Ireland final, you know there's going to be a huge atmosphere at it. The Mayo crowd will travel, the Dublin team the crowd will be there. Um, and yeah, like I said, 2013, 2017, those Ireland final pickers, I remember doing the parade and you know, scorching hot days, sun beaming down and the noise is just unbelievable. And like it's, that's kind of where you realise, yeah, this is where you want to be and you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And then once the game throws in, you kind of, just get back into game mode and get back doing what you do. And like I said, some of them games, particularly against Dublin, they were just all out attack and all out football and just two teams going at it as much as they could. And I suppose that probably made why they were such a good spectacle for supporters. Like it's easy for us kind of to watch back these games and watch the games live and we're just thinking, oh, sure, why did bloody Keith not do this or JC done well there or this kind of crack? But like it's all well good to say that. But like the heat of the moment, Keith, what is it really like? Because, you know, it's a piping hot day. You probably can't 
hear yourself think, feel yourself think. So, you know, you just have to be completely and utterly on it. Any little clink of the chain on a final, anything at all, Keith, you know, you're going to be found out. So I suppose what is it like? Because it's easy for us to kind of pass calm, pass remarks, tweets, whatever. But when you're on the pitch, like, what is it like? Because it just looks like madness. Yeah, it, it can be chaos at times. And I think if you look back at that 2014 replay semi-final against Kerry down in mm. Limerick, well, that one just was chaos. Like, it's, there's so much going on. Like, it was end-to-end football. There was goals going in everywhere. There was guys clashing heads and going off and cuffs. And obviously, with the way things ended at the end of it then as well. But I think that's probably, you know, as the years kind of move on, you kind of mature a small bit more and you kind of try and stay in this was folks know what's going on in the game you know I think 2013 that all Ireland final against Dublin there was again so much went on there that we'd have been a bit cuter a bit smarter we kind of kind of realised what was going on a bit more and played the, the scenario a bit better 2014 similar in that semi-final and I think then like I said 2017 the two semi-finals against Kerry and the game against Dublin we were a bit smarter in how we played I suppose a bit cuter in kind of how you manage the game at times maybe a bit if that makes sense um, and you kind of learn, I suppose, to figure out how it's going on and maybe just try and step away from the madness, you know, if, if that's the right way of putting it. So, um, I said it can be, but I think more, and again, it's not just a case of getting older. I think you kind of have to train yourself. I think probably Dublin and these guys will probably train themselves for scenarios like that. And, you, you know, you look back at the Ireland rugby team, you can train for the scenario after losing the All Blacks in the last minute and they said that wouldn't happen again. So they kind of train for scenarios like that. So, I think that the game has gone a bit like that where teams are kind of doing more of that and training under their match kind of situations and all that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's you know, like I said, the earlier years, it was complete madness. You kind of wonder what was going on at times, and it was just 100 miles an hour. But as the gears kind of went on, you kind of the game changed a bit more, a bit more taxed, and you kind of had to really figure it out through it a bit more, if that makes sense. So we can kind of hear the phrase, um, I think the All Blacks use win or learn, and I suppose we, we, you know, we hear defeats and stuff, but like, you know, what what was your mentality? You know, like obviously defeats were very hard and kind of getting back to that January slog after the finals and whatever you're having yourself, Keith. So like, you know, was that maybe a phrase the Mayo footballers adapted, you know, win or do we learn from this? Or you know, so what was your mentality yeah. behind some of them defeats? Yeah, and I think, you know, you'd probably hear James say it a lot now as well and take the learns from things. But I think probably in 2013, 2014, we, we didn't learn enough. Um, you know, I think we probably could have, you know, from 2012, 2013, we probably could have learned a bit more. We couldn't, like I said, that's what I'm saying, we could have been a bit cute for times during games rather than just being all out attack. Whereas, I think if you look at 2016 and 2017, when we did get really, really close to Dublin and, you know, four, three plays and get within a point, then, like, obviously, that team was at the height of their powers, the Dublin team. But I think we kind of figured our way out through that a lot, um, kind of managed the games a bit better. Um, you know, whether it was playing sweepers or who we were getting our matchups with and all that type of thing. So, um, yeah, I think we kind of got a bit better at it. But unfortunately, again, you come up against the Dublin team, we're probably the best team to ever play the game. And, you know, unfortunately, I think 2017, we probably played as well as we could have played and, you know, still just come up that bit short, which is frustrating. But in a way, it's probably not as bad as that we didn't play well and still lost, you know. Yeah, like and obviously, like I know there is kind of so much talk about this double team, and look, they are probably the best team of the century at this stage, Keith. But like, you know, and you're kind of after saying you did play it to the peak of your powers. Like from an ordinary Joe Soap, myself, anyone watching on, what the hell there is it, Keith? Because like, what is it that they do differently? Is it the lads coming off the bench? Is it different tactics to bring on to the field of play? I know they've had some sensational players in the past, but like, what is that little thing, Keith? And I know everyone is looking for that answer, but what was that thing on the field of play that you found was different? Um, I think probably in 2016 and 17, I think you kind of had to look at probably the power of their bench as well at times. You know, you had, uh, was it Cormac Costello came on in the 2016 and hit three points from play or something like that. You know, he was fresh in. You had Kevin McMenamin coming off the bench. He was flying as well. 17, Jamie Connolly came off the bench. And when you probably like that coming off the bench, it, it does make things very difficult. Obviously as well, and again, it's, an easy thing to say but it's a very hard thing to explain but when you have that kind of winning habit it does get you a long way mm-hmm. 2016 2017 they were used to being in positions where they need to see out the games but they were used to winning them whereas we're in the position where we need to see out the game but we're still trying to chase the small bit if that makes sense mm-hmm. um and they probably had that small bit more composure but I think a lot of it was just comes down to the quality that they had. Like, I mean, they had 17, 18, probably 19 players at the time who could have started and that were the highest quality. So 
you think you do a job on five or four or five of their forwards, the next thing they bring on Jim Connolly with 20 minutes to go or half an hour to go on. You know, it's, it can be disheartening, but at the same time, it's just when you have that quality coming on, it does make things very difficult or it makes things very easy for them, I suppose. Now, I think at the same time, you have to give them credit that they are a very smart football team as well. Mm. I mean, like, you know, obviously, Philly McMahon, Johnny Cooper, Keno Sullivan, these guys in, in defence, they know where to clog up the space. Keno Sullivan was sitting at six and playing that sweeper role very, very well. And then you have Fenton in midfield, who is probably one of the best midfielders to play the game. You know, so they have good footballers, but smart footballers. And once you have that combination, it's a very hard bet. 100%, Keith, 100%. And obviously, eight uh, Connacht titles for the Mayo senior footballers, and that's sensational going. And obviously, probably domination of Connacht, really. And I know Galway really did nip in for some of them years in the Roscombe, did also, uh, Keith. So, looking back, and obviously, Connacht is a very strong province. So, uh, eight Connacht titles, very proud to look back on, Keith. Yeah, definitely. I think when James came in in 2011 as well, you know, really kind of making a put our stamp on Connacht was a big game. Um, I think we won five in a row there between 2011 and 2015, which was huge. You know, we kind of just wanted to kind of really make sure we were the dominant team there and, you know, winning every game we could play in there. And obviously from 2016 onwards, you know, we've kind of struggled a bit in Connacht, which is a bit disappointing. But um, yeah, look, having eight kind of titles look back on it is something you'd be definitely hugely proud of. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose how good a preparation was the Connacht uh, Championship for the All Ireland series because there was some absolutely ding dong battles with the likes of Galway in the past, and we all know in Salt Hill and uh, everywhere that you still played in piping hot days, Keith. And we were talking about testing yourself against the best, but on a warm summer's day in Salt Hill, anywhere at all, Keith, uh, you could really find yourself in them days. Yeah, definitely. Like it's game we kind of always had that like that mentality that you know go out when Connacht is the easiest way to get to an All Ireland quarter final and. I don't mean easiest, but it's more straightforward, I suppose, you know, to put, like, playing some of them Galway and Roscommon teams, like, they had some really, really good players, you know, probably collectively, we're probably obviously the better team, and I don't mean that in any disrespect to them, but, look, when you're playing two of your biggest rivals, sometimes form and all that kind of stuff goes out the window, and it can just turn into a bit of chaos as well, but, um, you know, like, playing Galway up in Pier Stadium, Rose and Hot Day, and you've run around after Michael Meehan, it's, uh, it's tough going, but again, I suppose it's, it is kind of, again, where you want to be and what you want to be doing. I suppose, Keith, did you enjoy the role of kind of cornerback? Because I did, as I said a couple of minutes ago, you really did always have the toughest men to mark, and that was obviously going to be no midfield, but you did love the challenge of it. So did you enjoy kind of playing cornerback over the years? Yeah, yeah. It's funny, like, when I came in first, I suppose I would have always felt I was more of a halfback from playing underage and playing with the club. Um, but yeah, I was always in cornerback. And I wouldn't say I got comfortable in there, but I got, used to being in there and after a while it was just like you know that's kind of my favorite position that's where I want to be and like I said you kind of always had that challenge of being knowing that one slip could be a goal and uh, that was all in the back of the mind but again when you want to test yourself against the best typically they're the guys in corner forward so mm. yeah I definitely grew to enjoy it um grew to kind of enjoy making I suppose I wouldn't say making a name for myself but trying to make a name for myself as a good cornerback um trying to make a name for myself as a man marker but um, obviously the game changed then I suppose from probably 2012 onwards and you see cornerbacks now are kind of just as comfortable up the pitch kicking points so that kind of all changed and now sometimes his numbers are irrelevant but um, yeah look I enjoyed it I enjoyed the, the challenge of it um, and yeah look I suppose again when I was kind of starting off you were kind of looking at the likes of Mark O'Shea and Thomas Sullivan and Kerry mm-hmm. and Robbie McMenamum and Carl Lacey and you know, there were so many really, really good cornerbacks out there showing Marty Lockhart up in Derry. So there was re- some really good, teak tough cornerbacks, but who were also good footballers. And that's kind of what I wanted to be. So you know, there was plenty of kind of good, those guys to look up to. Definitely. I suppose over the years, like uh, when you were playing cornerback, how much did it change, Keith? Because obviously you were talking about bombing up and down the pitch, supporting probably the forward play. So how much did it kind of change from the early years to probably the present now? Because obviously you did do a very long spell with the Bayo footballers because you probably would have seen the whole advocate. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so when I started off, you know, if you're in cornerback, your job was to stop the corner forward, getting the ball, stop the scoring. If you happen to get on the ball, you were hand passing off as quickly as you could and running back in cornerback. Whereas now, like, like I said, these guys are more just as comfortable being up in the half forward line and getting on the end of moves and kicking points or scoring goals. I mean, you look at Ocean Mullen and Lee there from Mayo, like, were two prime examples. But, um, like, it just, I think even probably from 2012, 2013 onwards, it was a case of, you know, if the gap opens up, just go and someone who's kind of fill in and cover for you. Whereas previously would have been if you passed the forty five at all, you were told to get back as quick as you can. But obviously that look that's just the way the game developed. You need guys now who are comfortable playing anywhere because 
like the positions don't mean anything now at this stage and you know you kind of you could end up anywhere in the pitch so like it has changed hugely but that again is down to the tactics and where the game is played and how teams are setting up but I think the plus side of that is now you're kind of seeing 15 guys in the pitch who are all good footballers. Definitely, Keith. Obviously, yeah, for all stars as well, Keith, we were kind of touching them, at, uh, touching on them at the start, but that's obviously a, 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 probably a receipt of all the success that you did have in that particular year, Keith. So to tag on four all stars, that's probably probably most to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first one was one I kind—I of, wouldn't say I targeted, but I suppose after having a probably disappointing few years there from seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, you're kind of thinking, well, right, I need to kind of crack on here a bit and get moving. And like I said, I wouldn't say I set a target for myself, but it was would have always been back in mind that like right, this be nice to get. And you know, really enjoyed the first one. I think probably uh, 2013 one was probably a bit lucky. I don't think I kind of played too much in cornerback that year. I was up in half forward line for a while as well. <laughs> um, I won't complain. And then you know, 14 as well, I think it was kind of just built on the back of kind of a couple of games against Kerry and against James O'Donnell, who were probably overstated a small bit. Um, so I would have said 17 was probably, 12 and 17 probably the two would have deserved. The other two, I would have said, maybe a bit dubious. But the, the battle against James O'Donnell, who I think people still talk about that, Keith, so that was probably, you probably yeah. should have got an all-star for that alone, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and again, it's kind of, you look back on that one and it's, you know, you think you did okay at times, but you know, you look back, I think he got two six that day, like he might have maybe got two or three from play, but there's more plays he was involved in thinking, well, look, I'd done better there. He might have got a penalty or, you know, we could have won that game then. So, yeah, 2014 is one you kind of look back on with kind of mixed feelings, to be honest. Well, I suppose, Kate, how proud of you, uh, how proud are you for all? Because obviously, like, you've been through the trenches, you've seen it all for the Mayo kind of senior football. So when you do look back, and obviously you're still uh, doing a bit with the hurlers, of course, as well, winning when, when the Nicky Racket Cup last year. But I suppose, how proud are you of it all, Kate? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I'll be honest, it's probably not something I've kind of looked back on a huge amount just yet because I still have, still playing with the hurlers. Um, like I said, kind of earlier on, if I was to look back on it now, I'd probably say I was very, very lucky, first of all, because I wouldn't have seen myself as a footballer at that level for the first few years. Um, kind of re- I think I was really lucky that John Mahon brought me in at all in the first place. Um, still had some good guys around me who probably kind of helped me develop. But um, yeah, lucky is the one word I'd say. But I think when I look back and then you look back at some of the awards you got and the amount of medals you won in the big days out, you kind of really kind of go to was learn to look back on it with a bit of pride and a bit of enjoyment and look at the good times. So, yeah, I, I'd be honest, I haven't thought about it a huge amount just yet. <laughs> we'll save that for the days when I'm putting my feet up and uh, going grey and going bald. <laughs> fair enough, Keith, fair enough. I suppose to wrap up, uh, Keith, last few, you've been brilliant with your time. I suppose what advice kind of would you give a, maybe a young Keith Higgins around the country? Because obviously, as I said, you have seen it all, you've basically done it all. So, so what kind of advice would you give someone to make the breakthrough? Um, just keep practicing the basics. I think it's amazing how much you'll develop if you just literally have the ball in your hand all the time and you're practicing your kick passing off both feet. I know it sounds very, very simple, but if you're practicing the solo and off both feet, the hand passing, you get you out of so much difficulty. Like kick passing is the thing I probably didn't practice for about, I'd say, 10 years. And then all of a sudden, kind of when James came in, there was more of an emphasis of it for cornerbacks being a bit more ball playing at that stage. And like I said, you just practice and practice and practice and and it, it does develop. So that's the one thing I'd say to guys is really just focus on the basics. Um, it gets you out to so much trouble. And I think, you know, I always kind of use the term when you look back at the All Blacks playing rugby, like you never see them making any basic mistake by knocking balls on or kind of throwing forward passes. They just nail the basics all the time and they let the, foot, or the rugby skills kind of come in after that. So, you know, once you get the basics right, for me, everything else will follow on from that. And I have to ask, you came into my head there, I actually, I'm looking at this book, um, Andy Moore and Keith Higgins, what a man, he's just, uh, yeah. it, it just looks like he's honest, even when he's doing the podcast with Paddy Andrews, he's just, his brain just football, 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 he's, what a man. He never stops thinking football, well he never stops doing anything full stop, he's just a bundle of energy, um, but real, like, I'm, I'm not surprised he's gone into inter-county management just yet, you know, he's a real deep thinker of the game, he's a real philosophy in how he wants the game played. Um, really eager and enthusiastic. You know, he was. He probably kept our dressing room going for years. Um, and you know, I kind of said this the night of his book launch. He probably one of the reasons I was playing for Mayo at all because when we were down in Sligo, he literally dragged me to train and dragged me to gym sessions, and I probably owe my career to that man. So, mm-hmm. yeah, he's a legend, and he always will be a legend. Mm-hmm. 
100%, Kate, 100%. So, very last one, um, nice easy one. Uh, the toughest mm. player you played against and the best player you played with. Oh, toughest player I played against, is it? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's... I've been asked that a lot and I can never narrow it down, to be honest. Like, I mean, like when I start, I'll never forget Mark and Stevie McDonald from Armagh in a league semi final 2005, and he absolutely destroyed me up in Crow Park. I think he hit eight points. And that was probably my first time realizing that, yeah, we're, we're operating at a different level here, you know. Um, but yeah, he always stuck out in my mind Stevie O'Neill, Alan Brogan, the Gooch. Um, Jesus Christ. If I was to go at four, I'd probably go with them four. But then you're looking at other players you're leaving out, like Bernard Brogan, James O'Donnell, who Michael Megan. I mean, you can't, I can't narrow it down. To you're, you're giving me a headache even saying that, Keith. Oh, yeah. Christ. So, yeah. I couldn't pick one, but like them guys, like I said, some of the guys like Stevie O'Neill and Steve McDonald, like they were just outrageous Thanks. footballers, you know. Thanks. Thanks. Best player you played with? Probably Tartan. Yeah, again, like if you were to ask me who. Mayo's best footballer, I, I'd say Lee Keegan, hands down, all around best footballer, athlete, she's just an animal, um, can do everything, can man mark in the full back line, can go up and hit 1-1 one, one or 1-2 one, in an Ireland final, um, but then again, you can't look past Kieran McDonald, you know, the the skill that man had, what he could do with the ball, what he could do with in training, um, yeah, he was just phenomenal, so look, they're, they're two completely different footballers, but again, just two outrageous guys on the field. There you go, there you go, Keith Higgins. Thanks a million uh, for all that uh, chat. It was it was absolutely brilliant, and thanks a million for joining me this week. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by orcaretch.com and attack to the e. Use your promo code JMAC podcast to get fifteen percent off on orcaretch.com and get the best skins, gloves, equipment on attack to the e. Be attack minded. And if you like what you're seeing, like, subscribe on YouTube because support has been brilliant so far. Keith Higgins, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Yeah. Best Cheers, sir.